Okay, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to the seminar. So, just a small announcement uh, before we start. So, we are going to grant a few more days to um, suggest speaker for the next sem semester. One reason for that is that we had a huge, huge uh, gender imbalance in um, the suggestions that we received. Um, so don't hesitate to make more suggestions for us to have a less difficult time um, choosing and organizing for next semester. You, you want a woman or you want men? Uh, rather a woman. We have very, yeah. very few suggestions of uh, women and it's a bit difficult also to yeah. then um, yeah. organize uh, So with that, we're going to start. So as usual, we are moving in our mode, so don't hesitate to report any technical issues in the chat. And please use the Q&A tab to ask your questions. And with that, thanks very much, Alex, for introducing to the speaker. Yeah. All right, so uh, this is uh, my great pleasure to introduce today our speaker, uh, Professor Dan Nettel, who's come all the way down from Paris, where he's, uh, where he's now uh, um, Directeur de Recherche in, well, I become normal, right, uh, in the Evolution and Social Cognition team at the Institute jean Nico. But you also, you remain a professor at Northumbria University, where you Correct. spent uh, most of your career. If you don't know Northumbria, it's where the, you know, the last kingdom, I don't know if you know the series, it's very attractive for some reason. Uh, University, yeah. that's, exact, that's exactly how it is. <laughs> okay. uh, I've, I've been told not to uh, be too long uh, for the introduction, but I must say that uh, Dan is a leading figure in the field of human behavioral uh, ecology, uh, with his work on social inequalities. I remember uh, uh, his very influential uh, papers. He's, he works on various uh, applied topics uh, like economic and social inequality, trust cooperation, food insecurity, uh, whether you want to eat a lot for Christmas, uh, and moral and political cognition. Uh, he's got, if you want to know more about Dan, you can check out his blog uh, where you have books, uh, our course, introductory course, uh, lots of very fun and interesting writing and all his papers are open to all. Yes, and on this, um, over to you then. Thanks very much, Alex. Thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to present today work on food insecurity and obesity that I do with Melissa Bateson at Newcastle University. And uh, much of the clever stuff in here is hers. Um, I just make sure the trains run on time. Um, and uh, it's a mixture of work on humans and on birds. And um, one of the things I want to do is show why it's interesting to go back and forth from human work, where we have lots and lots of epidemiological data, to animal work, where we can manipulate things experimentally. And that's a very fruitful um, combination when you want to answer certain questions. So food insecurity is a... I, it's a social science concept. The, 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 the standard measurement comes from the US Department of, of Agriculture, the USDA. Um, it's a concept that describes the state when people have limited or uncertain access to food, right? So they, they're not sure, you know, can they afford to buy food today? You know, can, can they access the foods they want to eat? Do they worry that their food might be inadequate? So uh, it's a social science problem, and it's very, very widely measured in social science data sets, particularly in the USA. Also internationally, but particularly in the USA, and has been for about 30 years. And a surprisingly large number of people in a very affluent country like the USA, but also actually here in Europe, um, report that they are food insecure, that they either don't have money to get the food they want, or for whatever reason, they, 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 they don't reliably access sufficient um, and nourishing food. Now, it's been known for about um, 25 years that food insecurity, the state of being food insecure, is associated with an increased risk of obesity. Uh, so we did a meta-analysis in 2017 of 125 studies, and the headline result is up here in, in the top, uh, top line of this forest plot. 
that people who are food insecure are about 20, the odds are about 20% higher that they'll be obese than if they're, than if they're food secure. Um, and this is controlling for poverty, right? You're controlling for SES. I mean, different studies do it to different extents, but it does seem like quite a robust um, thing. So if you look at the studies that adjust for socioeconomic status, some sort of poverty measure, the odds of the odds ratio stays about the same. It's much stronger in women. So when you look at studies that just look at women, they really find this very strongly and pretty much absent in, in men, which is interesting. Most examples are mixed, and so you you find the association because it's a mixture of the women where you know where the association exists strongly and the men where it doesn't exist. So you mix samples, you get something in the middle. I'm not going to talk about that sex difference in humans today. I think it's interesting, but uh, time doesn't permit it. And this is really a thing you see in high income countries. Uh, in in, in low income countries, you don't tend to see, if anything, you sometimes see the opposite association. And what I take that to mean is that the food insecure people in African countries, for example, uh, have such limited access to food that they really, you know, they're really, you know, cr chronically food deprived. And so, of course, actually, if anything, they have lower body weights rather than the higher. But in, in countries like the West, where people are, uh, where women in particular are food insecure, they're more likely to, to, to be obese. Now, in the social science literature, this is widely considered a paradox. The people who can't get good enough access to food end up heavier than the people who can get all the food they like who are lighter. And people find this very, very paradoxical. And there's many, many papers written called you know, the, the food insecurity paradox or the paradox of concurrent food insecurity and obesity. It just doesn't make intuitive sense to people. Which is a shame because actually to behavioral ecologists, it's perfectly logical and has been well understood for decades. So this goes back to a paper um, by Stephen Lima in 1986 on predation risk and unpredictable feeding conditions in birds. And um, he and a whole, a whole tradition of work that began there actually sort of basically predicted that when you gave birds less good access to food, they would become heavier and store more fat. Um, the logic is really simple. Imagine a small bird in winter. You've got to get through the night and you can't feed in the night. And so at dusk, you need to have a kind of minimal reserve of fat that you're going to burn for your energy supply overnight. And you want to make sure you have at least that at dusk, otherwise you're going to die. Um, but if you carry much more than that, carry much more fat on your body, it becomes more difficult to fly, it becomes more difficult to take off. Your risk of dying by predation starts to increase because you know, you're heavier, you're less maneuverable, and that's well demonstrated. So the bird faced a trade-off between the probability of starving overnight and the probability of getting predated in the day by being too heavy. And what Lima showed in a really, really simple numerical model was how you resolve this trade-off depends on the predictability of your access to food, right? If you know that in the morning there'll be good food there, all you need to store is exactly enough to get you through the night. So... Uh, the, de the detail probably here is a little hard to see, but this bottom line here is the case of the bird that has an almost certain probability of having good access to food tomorrow. Now, that bird at nightfall needs to have just enough to get it through the night. There's no point in having it more because more makes it heavier and, and that causes problems. By contrast, the bird that's got a fair chance that tomorrow it actually won't have access to food not only needs to store what it needs to get through the night, but a buffer as well because, you know, Tomorrow comes and there's not enough food there. Maybe it even needs to get through a second day without good access to food. So that bird, even it needs to incur higher predation risk, but it needs to have a higher body weight. And this is the basic principle of what's come to be called the insurance hypothesis, that if your world, if your access to food is unpredictable, you need to insure yourself against probable shortfall, possible shortfall by carrying more fat. Um, I won't repeat it at too much of a length, but we've made a much, uh, many other people have modeled this. We've made a much, much more general model than Lima's specific assumptions about small birds. And basically, as long as you have, your probability of survival has this kind of asymmetric function where if you don't have enough energy in your body, you're going to die. <coughs> Whereas if you're carrying more energetic reserves than you need, it's a bit costly, but it's an asymmetric thing, right? By being a kilo too heavy, you don't immediately die. It might be less good because it causes certain costs for locomotion, for other things you want to do. 
but it doesn't kill you. Whereas not having enough, it's a catastrophe. And quite reliably, uh, what these models show is that if the probability of having, having food in every time period, for example, tomorrow morning is one, you need to carry just enough. You know, there's no need for a buffer. But the more the probability of having food in the next time period goes down, the more you should set a higher target weight in order to make sure you have insurance. And when you do simulations of individuals that follow the optimal strategy for these different ecologies, you predict that indeed individuals in very reliable food environments wouldn't be fat, and the more unreliable they're, more insecure their food environment, the fatter they would be, but there would also become more variation. That's because in, in a food insecure world, you're trying to hold a buffer, but of course you might not manage it because by definition that world is variable. And so sometimes you might, you know, manage to overshoot your buffer because you have like a few good days in a row, and sometimes you might undershoot it. There'd be a lot of variability that you would be aiming for a higher target. That's the basic prediction that's come to be known as the insurance hypothesis. Okay, now what I'm going to do is talk to you about our work in the European Starling. This, because this is a system in which you know, this, this phenomenon could be very um, easily studied. And the great thing about Starling is, of course, or any animal model, is that whereas in humans you rely on, on natural variation in food insecurity, an epidemiological approach, you can manipulate it experimentally in, in birds. So these are wild caught birds we study in Northumberland. Um, so in this experiment, this long-term experiment, we captured two groups of 40 birds. We put them uh, in two aviaries, four aviaries in fact, they were subdivided. Um, and in, in one pair of aviaries, they had food all day, every day. In the other pair, five days out of seven, we randomly deprived them of food for five hours at a time that they couldn't predict. So you know, maybe when they get up in the morning, there's nothing there. Maybe the last five hours before they go to bed, there's nothing there. Five days out of seven. And this is the curve of their body weights, two groups, the control group and the insecure group over 19 weeks. And what you see, well, firstly, it's all moving around all over the place. That's because starlings do change their body weight a lot, particularly with temperature. So as, as, you know, as things get colder, starlings get heavier and, and up with other factors, in fact. So they're kind of moving around all over the place, but you see that a subtle difference in body weight does emerge between the two groups. It's about two grams on an 80 gram bird. That's not vast, but it's more than 1% of its body weight. And then when you fat score for, for the electoral fat, you, you, you basically don't, in the insecure condition, you don't find any birds with, with very low fat score, kind of rather a few more. With, when we fat score them, of course, blind to which aviary they would come from. So over 19 weeks, they put on uh, more weight, but it's a small effect. But this is very crude, right? To do this, basically before dawn every two weeks, we have to burst into the aviaries wearing head torches and kind of grab birds off perches and things. It's, it's a mess, you know, it's bad for the birds' welfare, it's very difficult to do well. And so we can only end up wearing them every few weeks. Um, so what Melissa did was invent a technology social foraging system, which allows us to study uh, weight maintenance much, much in a much less in invasive, ecologically uh, straightforward way um, <laughs> by, by inventing this thing called the social foraging system. So the social foraging system is a kind of vending machine for starlings. Um, the bird wears an RFID tag on its leg. It comes and perch, um, perches on this little perch, which you have to make very short to try and stop two birds coming at the same time. The perch floats on a load cell balance, so we get the weight, the bird, the RFID tells us who we've got, the load cell balance tells us how much they weigh, and the bird then presses a key to achieve food, so we know when they foraged as well, timestamp that. And you get many hundreds of data points a day, and we don't need to intervene. Um, you can sort of see how this goes. The starlings, they're just, it's maybe not very clear, but they're just in an aviary, they're hanging out. When they want to feed, they go onto a unit, they get weighed, they press for some food. The thing we really discovered from this is that, you know, when, it, when its basic needs are met, the European starling spends most of its time in the bath. And this is sort of an interesting thing about them. They basically just have a lot of baths. Going, but when they're not having baths, they go to these units and uh, uh, check in 
get themselves away and get some, some food. And this is in closed economy, so all of their food is coming from these units. What we can do in this paradigm is make the birds food insecure by making the units not work sometimes. And there's different ways of doing that. You can either have, you know, turn them off for five hours a day at random, or you can turn them off for 20 minutes and then turn them back on. Or you can simply have it that when the bird presses the key, it's only probabilistic whether the whether the key delivers food or not. We've done all of those. These are all just slightly different ways of invoking food insecurity. I'm just going to present, oh, well, this is the kind of data we get. So this is for uh, an aviary of 11 birds. You get every day hundreds of weights or dozens of weights from each bird. Generally, they look pretty smooth. You get some weirdnesses where another bird is kind of landing on there or, you know, it's got its one leg is not on the perch or something. So, you, so we have an algorithm that removes impossible weights, like a bird that some, some time suddenly gained 30 grams or whatever. But it allows us to actually show in quite a lot of detail how the bird's weight changes over the course of the day and it also estimates its weight at the end of the day and, and indeed at, at dawn. So that's what the data look like. Um, okay, I'll, I'll tell you briefly about four experiments using this system. Um, all of these experiments share the same basic design, which is for a week, the birds are food secure. The, the units work all the time. As long as the lights are on, the birds can just go forage whenever they like. And then after a week, their weight stabilized. We introduce some kind of food insecurity. And as I say, there are different ways of doing that. You can turn the units off for short periods, for long periods, or just make it probabilistic whether they work. But you know, don't worry about those details. In these different experiments, we do that in different ways, either for one week or in some of those experiments, we did a second week where we intensified the food insecurity. And then in a couple of the experiments, we went back to food security after. I'm not going to talk about that much uh, right now. Um, we've only managed to do this with small numbers because we've actually got a relatively small number of units that you can use at a time. These are actually quite um, diff difficult bits of technology to keep optimized. You get a lot of shit in the balance of stuff you can imagine. So, so it's quite hard to kind of keep it going. We, I think Melissa has now got 12 working at the same time, and that's, that's the most she's ever been able to do. Um, to cut a long story short, there's a lot of variability between experiments, you know, uh, between, and even between aviaries within the same experiment. But if anything, the birds put on weight, sometimes quite a lot. So this is, this is the, the, the difference in mass at the end of the day between the, uh, the food insecurity condition and the previous week when they were food secure. That's the, that's the gain. And as you can see in many of the aviaries and experiments, there's a clear positive effect. Some of them we don't see. Some of them there doesn't seem to be much change. And then there's, a, there's some heterogeneity there, but also the numbers of birds are small. Some of these are only uh, you know, six birds or even three birds. So you know, there's, there's some slop there. But if you measure analyzing all these things, there's a clear signal, which again is that they gain about two grams, which is what the long-term experiment also showed. And is consistent with what we know from other experiments. And when this weight loss happens, it's really quite, quite striking. <laughs> the advantage of having nice temporal resolution data with the social foraging system. You know, this is, uh, this is a, an aviary where food insecurity started here on day seven. And you, you can see, you know, to the naked eye, something's going on with these birds. They're responding by putting on weight. Uh, it's not always that clear, but that's just a particularly nice example. Okay, so. It seems that in the birds, we can really say that food, the effect of food insecurity on body weight is causal. It's not just a correlational thing. You can manipulate it, and the birds respond by gaining weight. Now, what we had thought, I suppose, intuitively, and what the human food insecurity literature always assumed was that's because when people are food insecure, what they do is eat loads of food when they have got it to make a... To make a a buffer for the times when they haven't got it. So people had just naturally assumed that overall calorie consumption would be higher under food insecurity. You'd do it when you had the food to buffer you through the times when you didn't, but the overall amount would be bigger. In fact, this is clearly not the case in these experiments. So in the long-term experiment, the food secure and food insecure groups ate about the same, even though uh, the food insecure groups ended up heavier. And again, in the SFS experiments, if anything, the, 
in under food insecurity, the birds eat less. Probably mainly because they've got less time to do it. There's just less time when they can be eating from those. You know, the, the, the size of the gut is a constraint. The starling can only eat so much in a bowel. And so if, if you've got less time to do it during the day, you just end up being less. So these birds are actually eating a couple of grams less of food on average. But I, across the same set of experiments, I, you know, I remind you on the previous slide, they were gaining a couple of grams of weight. So they're, they're gaining more, not by eating less. Which means what's happening is they must be, in some sense, becoming more efficient at making food into fat. <laughs> They're doing something else that means they can make their food into fat in a different way. By the way, this actually also turns out to be true in the data on humans. So it was widely assumed that food insecure people ate loads of energy dense food when they did have food to sort of compensate for the times they didn't get it. But in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Surveys, the sample of 3,000 women, we show that this is not the case, at least if you can believe those data. Food insecure women are considerably heavier in this, in this data set, but they don't eat more calories, or not to any substantial degree. The calorie estimation is done in NHANES by, they do a diary at the end of the day with all of the things they ate. Now it's a self-report me method and probably has some limitations, but nonetheless, there's really no indication that uh, food insecure women are consuming more calories although their body weight is clearly higher. So it's possible that the same is going on in humans. Under food insecurity, people are getting fatter without necessarily eating more. People find this really weird. They just, you know, we're so used to thinking, well, you get fat by eating more, right? That's how people get fat. And there aren't any other possibilities apart from maybe doing less physical activity. I'll say more about that in a minute. But in fact, there are loads of other possibilities, right? The basic principles of any energy allocation are you put some things in your mouth. Firstly, you don't absorb everything, that's all of the calories that are potentially available in your food. The gut is actually very plastic and it can absorb more or less depending on, on its transit time on the, on the gut bacteria and all kinds of things. So there's a lot of plasticity around how much of that food you actually absorb. That could change under food insecurity. But also then once you've got your energy, <coughs> You've got many degrees of freedom about how you allocate. Basically, we allocate the energy from our from our food intake between growth, movement, somatic maintenance, reproductive investment, and fat storage. And you can trade off all of these against each other, right? You can put on more fat with the same amount of intake, for example, by doing less investment in your immune system. There are many ways that you can um, gain weight or put on more fat without taking in more food. So do we have any evidence on how starlings trade off these different components? Well, firstly, we did find some evidence that um, when you make birds food insecure, they, um, they absorb more out of the food that they do eat. Probably, we know actually that starling has an incredible capacity to grow more gut and, and make more microvillians and stuff, when, depending on what food it has available to it. But also they can slow their gut transit time, they're eating less. So they actually absorb more, um, more calories. Now, when I was a young researcher starting out, if someone had said to me, you're gonna spend a part of your life burning starling poo, I would have been surprised. But this is what we did. We collected poo for a month and we, um, we burned it in a bomb calorimeter. So what you're doing there is saying, how many kilocalories of energy remain in this food that has passed through the bird. And obviously if more remains, that means it's absorbed less. Uh, and indeed, again across several experiments, <clears throat> you find that food insecurity leads to the, the birds producing guano with less energy density, which suggests that they've absorbed more of the energy. They've actually changed their digestion in some way. So although this effect was significant, it's really, really small. It can't do enough to account for the fact they managed to gain weight while taking in less, uh, but it could help, it could contribute. But what about growth? Well, these poor birds in the long-term experiment, every few weeks what we did was um, cut a tail feather. So starlings have a, uh, an identifiable number of tail feathers, so we cut the tail feather um, a number of times at the beginning of the experiment and the five weeks in at the end. And actually, we find again a small but significant difference in the rate of regrowth of the feather. The food insecure birds regrow their feathers more slowly, 
And I suggest what's happening is they're just diverting energy to fat storage away from other things they could be doing, like regrowing their, their feathers, we see here. Again, it's a small effect, but it's sort of, sort of interesting. And perhaps most intriguing in terms of somatic maintenance, we measured the, uh, the length of the telomeres on erythrocytes. So erythrocytes in birds are nucleated, so they have DNA, so you can measure things like telomere length. And so for those of you who don't know, telomeres are the, uh, the DNA caps on all vertebrate chromosomes that gradually shorten with age and they shorten with uh, replicative activity, but you can repair them. Like repairing them is a thing you can do, and there are certain tissues in your body where you do repair them. For example, in the germline, that's why every generation is born with telomeres just as long as their parents, because in the germline, telomerase protects these uh, protects these these structures from attrition. But you don't fully repair telomere uh, damage in lots of other tissues, particularly, for example, blood um, and some others. So gradually, with age, your telomeres shorten. But you, this is an active investment. Keep allowing your telomeres to shorten or reversing their shortening is, um, is an active investment that's metabolically expensive. And what we find, what we found is that um, we have a very significant difference in erythrocyte telomere length between the control and insecure birds. Now, I'm absolutely staggered by this. And I'm still, I still think we still just don't really know if we believe it. And the reason is that um, this difference appears within two weeks, which is extraordinary. And its magnitude is completely incomprehensible. It's 500 base pairs. Now, to give you some sense, human telomeres shorten in adulthood by about 30 base pairs a year. So 500 base pairs is 18 years of aging or something. And it was happening in, in two weeks. I mean, we're completely staggered by this. It's extraordinary. But we measured the terminal restriction fraction with southern blotting, which is the most precise method of, of telomere attrition by people who are blind to the hypothesis. So it does seem to be a thing. And what's more, with erythrocytes, with, with human um, uh, blood telomere length, which is done in leukocytes, you always have concerns that all that's happened is you've changed the proportion of different leukocyte cell types uh, for some reason to do with your immune system. So you're never really sure you're measuring the same thing. But these are erythrocytes. And there's only one kind of erythrocyte and they, they're all made in the same place. So something extraordinary is happening here. This is an absolutely vast difference. And moreover, so your telomere length is actually not a single number. It's a distribution because you have many chromosomes in, your, in the cells of your blood. Some of them have short telomeres and some of them have long. And um, so you've got, everyone has actually a telomere length distribution in every tissue. And comparing the foods insecure and food secure birds, where you see the difference is in the long telomeres in that distribution. Now this makes a lot of sense because when telomeres get very short, you really start to repair them. That's because if they become critically short, those cells can no longer replicate. So short telomeres attract telomerase, which is the repair enzyme. But long telomeres, you kind of don't need to repair them yet. You know, you're going to let them shorten a lot more before you need to start repairing them. So models predict that it's in the long telomeres where reduced investment in some maintenance function could really show. Because those are the ones that it's not going to kill you if you, you know, it's not going to do you any damage if you, if you, if you just skip on repairing them. And that's exactly what we see, which again, you know, I find these data are absolutely extraordinary. And when you look at the epidemiology of telomere length in humans, People argue about, you know, a 15 pace pair, base pair difference between people who have more stressful or less stressful environments. And yeah. if we've got 500 base pairs, it's just incomprehensible, uh, you know, but there you are, that's, it is what it is. Um, okay. So at the very least, we have three evidence that the food insecure birds are doing three things differently. They're absorbing more food from, uh, absorbing more calories from their food, they're regrowing their feathers more slowly, so presumably spending less energy on that, and seem to be reducing investment in activities of somatic maintenance that shows up in shorter telomeres. So, in fact, once you understand this, it's completely comprehensible that they would be able to gain weight even without putting more food through their beaks, um, because, in fact, you've got all of these, these sources of things that you can save. So how does it how does this apply to humans as thinking? Well, 
In the human obesity literature, there's just a widespread intuitive assumption. There's only two things you can do to become fatter. You can eat more or move less. You know, and then people argue, is the main source of the obesity epidemic eating more or being less physically active? And the answer seems to be pretty clearly neither of those is sufficient, right? Because in fact, there's not much evidence we eat that many more calories in the last 30 years, which people are much fatter. And surprisingly, in the last five or 10 years, it's become evident that the average, the average sort of European doesn't move much less than the average hunter gatherer bit less, but not, you know, not that much. And moreover, importantly, the part of your meta metabolic, your energy expenditure, which is to do with moving around is a really small part, right? So actually athletes and marathon runners and people don't spend many more calories a day than people who are sedentary because the vast bit of your, of your energy expenditure is, is the resting energy expenditure that, which includes what's called the basal metabolic rate. The stuff you do, even if you sit on your bed all day, is most of what you spend. And in fact, when you become more active, there's some evidence that what you do is diverse energy to moving from other functions without much increasing your total daily energy expenditure. So we've actually known for a long time that humans have plasticity in their energy expenditure, which is not completely explained by how much they move around. And we first started to know this, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this famous experiment, the Minnesota semi-starvation experiment. This is where seven vol 17 volunteers agreed to basically do what our starlings do uh, in a way, except much more severe, which is they lived ad, ad libitum for a while in this place in Minnesota, and then their food intake was enormously decreased. And these people were conscientious objectors who didn't want to fight in the war, but they wanted to contribute to the um, the reconstruction effort by understanding what the effects were of the of the famine which was widespread in europe in the immediate aftermath of world war ii what what the effects behaviorally and physiologically of that were going to be uh, so they um, you know they, they volunteered for this experiment now what happened well they, they lost a lot of weight no surprise you know they went down to like half of their ad lib libertine energy intake or less i think even. they lost a lot of weight and they moved around a lot, a lot less but the most important thing is their total energy expenditure per day really went down. And it went down much more than can be explained by the amount less that they moved, uh, or indeed by the amount of fat they lost. It really seems there's a lot of plasticity. We can turn down our energy expenditure, not just on the physical activity component. And in fact, we know that people's daily energy expenditure, when you measure this with indirect calorimetry, is really variable from individual to individual. I mean, some people spend a thousand calories more than others of the same body mass in a day. And we, we don't, you know, we don't know why that is. But it's not all explained by activity. Even when you take the part which is just the basal energy expenditure, the amount you would spend if you sit on your bed, that's actually incredibly variable from individuals of the same body size. So clearly that we have some facultative ability to to, to downregulate what we spend on certain uh, you know, on, on things like immunity, repair, other functions. Um, so the, and this is widely understood, and I think it's been understood that in the concept of, um, of weight loss, what might be happening is that you're, you know, turning off some functions other than, than act, physical activity. But I don't, don't think that idea has been much, much discussed in the context of weight gain, that the way you might gain weight might be neither by eating more nor by moving less, but actually by just down-regulating some of these other things that you have some physiological control over. So what do we, what do we, does that help us understand food insecurity in humans? Well, there's a few things that are interesting to, to point out. We don't have a lot of data on how food insecure humans gain weight, actually. I mean, I think it's something that's the topic of active investigation, but we don't really know at the moment how they gain that weight. Um, as I said, it doesn't seem to be necessarily by increasing their total energy intake. We do know that food insecurity is associated with depression, clinical depression, with an incredibly large effect size. So this is a study where they divided a large sample of people into four categories of food insecurity. So food security is totally food secure, and these, are, these three groups are increasingly severe food insecurity. And they looked for concurrent diagnosis of major depression. Actually, it's not diagnosis, it's like having fulfilled in a rating scale that's 
equivalent to a, a psychiatrist diagnosis. And when people are really food insecure, their odds of depression are like four times higher. And this is a massive effect size. You know, it's absolutely, you, don't, you never see odds ratios of four in human epidemiology. This is enormous. So one of the things we can do when they can't get access, this is correlational, of course, but it seems like maybe one of the things that people do when they can't get access to enough food is they just don't want to do anything. Right? You know, they just become anhedonic. They don't want to move. They don't want to initiate things. These are what the symptoms of depression are. So that's one thing. People might spend less energy by becoming depressed, just between hunkered down and being having little desire to, to, to move around and so on. Um, now, another really interesting thing we do know about food insecurity in humans is it's really strongly associated with diet, right? So food insecure people, people who experience food insecurity, have a higher risk of dying in prospective studies. Even when you, obviously those people are also poorer, you know, obviously they also live in general in places with higher mortality rates and all that, but even when you control as much as is possible for their poverty and their other associated socioeconomic factors, you still end up with the odds of dying if you experience food insecurity are at least 50% higher than if you don't, even controlling as much as possible for everything else. Now, what are they dying of? It turns out they're dying of everything. Um, so what uh, food insecurity is particularly associated with is what medics call multimorbidity, having several things go wrong at the same time, it's having a lot of you know, bad stuff happen to your health. And this is the meta-analysis of a bunch of studies that looked at having multimorbidity, which is defined as having, you know, in different ways in the studies, it's like having several serious illnesses at the same time. Um, compared to control condition, which is having either one serious illness or none. And across all of these studies, food insecure people are more likely to have lots of different things go with them, go wrong with them. They have more strokes, they have more heart problems, they have more metabolic problems, they have, you know, they just have a whole range of things. Now, this is correlational data, and you don't want to get too excited about what, what might be going on. But I think what our bird work suggests is one way of thinking about this is when you're food insecure, you want to gain weight because your body wants to make a buffer. To do that, it has to sequester energy from other things that you're doing. And one of the big things that it can sequester energy from is self-maintenance. You know, the various ways in which you're ma maintaining your soma, you have to do less maintenance in. Now, down the line, that might be in the short term an adaptive strategy, but down the line, that means more of your body systems start to have problems sooner. Uh, than, than if you were food secure. At least that's that's an interpretation of these data. If not the interpretation that their authors particularly give, it's just it's the way I would gloss it. Okay, I'm coming towards a conclusion uh, here. So the first thing to say is that um, food insecurity promotes an active reallocation of energy to fat storage away from other functions such as maintenance, possibly sometimes involving eating more, but not necessarily. Um, uh, and, and away, away from functions such as maintenance and maybe growth. Now, this means that individuals facing food insecurity in both starlings and humans can gain fat uh, even without eating more. Of course, this has problems down the you know, this has consequences down the line, some of which are negative, but that doesn't mean that it's not an adaptive strategy, right? It's a trade off. It's, you're, you're gaining something now by, by turning off something else that you might need later. So you could see this as an adaptive strategy because exactly, as I've said, in situations where access to food is uncertain, you, you need uh, fat as an insurance. Now, I just want to caveat that by saying, I'm not saying in humans either that all of the obesity epidemic we see is just adaptive mechanisms just working just fine because some of the BMIs we see in humans are really very, very high. And they, I mean, I don't think it could ever make adaptive sense to have a BMI of 40. It might make adaptive sense to be a few kilos heavier if you're in an insecure environment, but it doesn't probably make much adaptive sense to have a BMI of 40, right? So I, I'm not saying all of all of human obesity is, is kind of the normal function of these kind of mechanisms, or that food insecurity explains all of the obesity ep epidemic. Clearly it doesn't, right? So even in populations where there's very little food insecurity, in the last 20 or 30 years, the obesity rates have skyrocketed. So it could be a contributory factor that explain why some people are more prone to obesity than others, but it's not, it's not like a monofactorial explanation for the rising BMI in Western populations. 
But I think what it does illustrate is that um, this is a topic where social scientists have just said, we're just baffled by this. There's this association. Why the hell would that exist? It doesn't make any sense to us. But actually, we can show that from an evolutionary, an adaptive evolutionary perspective, you can see this as arising from the normal functioning of evolved mechanisms that just make adaptive sense. So you can think about what these mechanisms are doing in their environment. As I say, that doesn't imply that the actual absolute levels of BMIs uh, in, in contemporary Western populations are some sense the optimal ones from a fitness perspective. They're probably not. But rather that the mechanism, the fact that people would respond to this variability in their food, uh, in their in their food experience by um, putting on a bit of fat, is, is perfectly comprehensible. But also the evolutionary perspective of trade-offs helps us think about the fact that, well, yeah, if you do that, something else has got to give. And so there might be these costs in terms of uh, long-term health uh, and so on. Um, and then finally, I'd just like to add, uh, you know, I think this, this kind of work illustrates why it's really fun to have an animal model and a human and a human epidemiological model as well, right? Because you can do things experimentally in, in, the, in the bird system that you can't do in humans. And then there's data on humans that you don't have uh, in the birds. There's a whole issue about, you know, why birds, why didn't you do this in a mouse and so on? But uh, you know, there are various answers to that. And I actually think, I think the birds actually have a great system to study weight maintenance because it's kind of small enough that it's got to get it right. Uh, and it's long lived enough that, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it faces sort of trade-offs over, over the long term. And they're very, very easy to study in captivity. Okay, that's the end of my talk. I look forward to your questions. Great talk, uh, Daniel. Um, could you possibly reinterpret your findings to say that you're getting a bit of <laughs> I think please return my sound off. Yeah. I think you should turn off your sound. Roger, Roger. Wow, yeah. yeah. I think we're good. Okay, you. good. Yeah. So it's actually insecurity or stress that's the causal mechanism here and nothing else. And if you give the individual enough food, then they put on weight. So the stress can come from food insecurity, but it could be that you can impose stress, let's say, simulate predation mm. in your birds mm. and give them enough food and they'll gain weight. Mm and controlling for the amount of food, yeah. right? So it's actually a stress response, and it just happens to be that yeah. food insecurity is one way yeah. to cause that. Well, so that's a great question, because actually this has been done. And if you, if you, if you expose them to cues of predation, the opposite happens, they lose weight, right? So controlling for the amount of food, yeah. Which is actually cool, right? Because if there are predators around, what you want to be able to do is fly well. So you're, you know, but, so that particular example, we know the answer, and it's not that. But I do take your point, I think in humans in particular, lots of things are associated with obesity, not just food insecurity, like just general economic insecurity, you know, life stress, pandemic, all kinds of stuff. And so it could be that the class of stressors, I don't think all stressors would make you put on weight, but the class of stressors may be broader than what I'm implying. Were our ancestors obese? Uh, they weren't obese, but uh, I mean, I think we can be pretty clear that they were never obese. You... Yeah, well, from what we, what we know from extant hunter-gatherers is that they're, they're never obese, but, they're, but they have varying, varying amounts of adipose tissue, and some of them would have BMIs of, you know, 24, 25, so borderline overweight, and, you know, there is some variation there. Now, it never goes out to... BMIs of 35, 40, which you see in Western populations. Right? So the distribution is not the same, but there's no doubt that there's some variation both within and between individuals in adiposity. There we go. I had a question about, um, so in the experiment with starlings, so you uh, manipulate the food insecurity, but you also manipulate in the same way the total amount of food that is available for the birds. And so how can you, well, you know, when you see decrease in growth and maintenance, how can you separate the fact that the birds that we allocate are as a plastic allocation strategy, or it's just that the level of resources is less? So yeah. Even if they have the same allocation strategy, they will invest less in less. 
Well, yeah, except that that would predict that, I mean, if you have the same allocation strategy and less input, everything goes down, right? <laughs> Whereas the fat gets more. Yeah. So that must be a different allocation strategy. It can't just be there's less. If there's less, you know, let's say I'm giving 20%, 20%, 20%, 20%, 20% and then there's less, then everything goes down. But in fact, the fat goes up. <laughs> so it can't, it can't be that. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, but the, what is not completely clear from me. Yeah, the, of the allocation is changing because the strategy is increasing. But uh, are you really allocating less to um, growth or maintenance? I'm not sure how you can uh, uh, actually quantify that. Um, well, it's certainly, I mean, if you can get different effects, right? One thing goes down whilst the other goes up, then I think you can make a strong claim about allocation. Now, we don't know exactly you know, what the allocation is, but if, some, if one thing is going up while something is going down, then you know, you've allocated differently, that seems to me. Um, would it be useful to measure the levels of uh, the hormones involved in fat storage, at least in the bird model, you know, to, when you compare different, um, different types of uh, food restriction with uh, short periods where, uh, versus long periods? to see what exactly uh, triggers the change in, in resource allocation, at what time it starts? Um... Yeah, absolutely. Um, of course, I mean, there's a whole lot of biology about how this must work. So leptin and ghrelin are not well studied in birds. We don't really know, you know uh, what happens. And also there's limited potential for doing non-lethal non studying of, of gut hormones. You can do some hormones in blood, but I mean, you have to catch the birds all the time. It's a nightmare. And the main thing is if we, we can take blood samples, but we really think it it's, has such a massive stress. You know, we know this, right? If you catch a bird to take blood samples, it's incredibly stressful and they don't eat for a day afterwards, probably because they think they're being predated, right? I mean, that's, you know, so you have, you, the reason we don't sort of stop to get blood samples and stuff in these experiments is that itself has such a huge impact that it's sort of almost dwarfs the thing we're trying to study. But in an ideal world, yeah, you would, you would measure those things. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, because in the wild, they don't have permanent access to food. And they might be deprived for 20 minutes, one hour, even maybe five hours. So I wonder to which extent your stressor like, is more than what they experience in the world. Is it mm. a stressor? Is it just a normal? Yeah. Um, that's a very good question. Um, people who work on starlings have sort of come up with this kind of five hour thing. But it, I don't really know why. I think it's because basically it's the maximum amount of time we can do and still sleep at night because it's terrible working with birds because you really do worry you're going to find them dead in the morning, you know, and that would be bad. So I, everyone in, every in, the, in, in the sort of literature seems to say, well, we can do five hours without worrying about it. I mean, for various reasons, I have seen starlings survive, survive 24 hours without food, but, you know, it starts to get. So, so I, we don't know. I mean, it would be great to have data from the wild you know, on what really happens. I'm always very struck in winter. You know, it seems to me there must be long periods where they can get very little to eat. They can switch what they eat and they'll, you know, starlings, they'll, they'll change their foraging strategy if stuff's not available. But I, I don't know. I, it's enough that I think it's probably pushing the limit of what they can do. But I, I don't know if people who study wild birds really know, you know, what, what it is. Uh, thank you for um, the talk. And I had, um, I was uh, wondering how, um, I was a bit surprised to see that in high income, income countries, humans um, don't eat more, but are more fat. Mm. Um, because intuitively, I would have thought that they would eat more um, food and sicker people would eat maybe more uh, processed foods that yeah. um, make you fatter. Yeah. And um, so it's not the case for birds. And I, I understand that you treated this in a more mechanistic approach, but I was wondering if how that could um, change like the amount of calorie intake, the type of food you're eating. Well, I mean, this is a good point. So the caloric values of foods, you know, that you read about don't really reflect what you would absorb. And one of the things that about Western highly processed diets is that you probably end up absorbing a lot more of the available calories. If you eat nuts or, you know, raw plants, 
you don't really, although, you know, if you burn those things in a bomb calorimeter, it says there's a certain degree of calories in them. You don't extract that. Whereas modern industrially processed foods, you extract something much closer to the potential energy in it because they're highly, they're made to be really energy available. They're made to be very digestible. They're very prepared. They're, you know, they're cooked. They're, so when people say, oh, the total caloric intake of people in the West hasn't gone up, I mean, that's the amount that goes in their mouth. It's not the amount that goes through their gut wall because, because the foods have changed. Now with the starlings, when we do this experiment, we keep the food, the diet, of course, constant because we don't want that to be a variable. But it, it, in other words, if our data suggests that food insecure people are not taking in more calories, it, that doesn't exclude that they're taking them in, in different forms, for example, with more sugars and these things. And there's some evidence of that. And that, that makes a difference right, to, to the weight gain potential of a food. It's not just the number of calories that are theoretically there, but it's also the form it comes in. So I hope that answers your question a bit. Yeah. So we have a question online by Philippe Jean. Philippe, uh, listen to you now. So uh, I don't know, I'm a specialist, I heard that there was uh, some um, people talking about the implication of the macrobiota in uh, mm. obesity. Mm. And I was curious to know whether, how it would fit with this general yeah. expectation of uh, yeah. plasticity in allocation. And... No, it's a great question. The answer is I don't know. I don't know. But I think it's very plausible that. So, firstly, if you can change the absorption, that seems very plausibly to do with your microbiota. Could be, that could be the mechanism, right? Um, I, so I think the plasticity at the level of the gut, you know, what you absorb, how much you, it could well be to do with changing microbiota. And also mechanistically, it seems plausible that if your food is coming in, in a more irregular pattern, that's going to select for a different microbiotic ecosystem, you know, or you change the, you, know, you change the different foods. We know that's going to change. So somehow it should, probably should be involved, but I don't, you know, I don't know how to think about that. I don't have any evidence. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now we try online with the question of uh, Germain. Germain, we can listen to you. Yes, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if uh, you have tested this of, or if you have seen it in other uh, experiments, if you provide different types of food to these birds, uh, for example, with different uh, fat contents, do you see any switch or change in the food choice when they become insecure, for example, towards more uh, energetic or fattier types of food? Um, thank you for that question. No, we haven't done that. We do know that they're they, we know that in general, starlings can shift their food preferences. So for example, if you keep them on a low protein diet um, and then offer them insects versus fruits, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll more strongly favor the insects. So they do have this kind of ability to shift. But in these experiments, we've just given them the same diet throughout because it just seems simpler. Uh, but that's definitely something you could do in principle. Okay, thank you. Okay. Would you say that uh, food insecure uh, birds uh, age faster? <laughs> <laughs> because you showed that um, with food insecurity, there is an increase in morbidity, which we know is all explained by aging. Mm. And so, so would you say they age faster? And generally, how do you distinguish between the trade-off and the constraints? 
Uh, I'd like, do you have data on uh, reproductive success, for instance? Or... So no, those are all good questions. So firstly, um, we've done nothing on reproduction. These birds are all in a non-reproductive condition. We keep them that way by, um, by having a constant day length. The starlings, they respond to the day length. They only go into reproductive condition when you give them short, short days and then long days. We never do that because it causes mayhem. They all start building nests, you know, all sorts of other stuff goes on. So we haven't wanted to go there. <laughs> so, so these are all birds in non-reproductive condition. Uh, and I mean, when a starling is in non-reproductive condition, it's really in non-reproductive, it even regresses its gonads, right? So, I mean, this is, but, but because birds are so optimized for, you know, not doing any, any stuff that you don't currently need. I mean, they even regress their gonads. You can't even sex them when they're, you know, they're, they lose their secondary sexual characteristics. It's amazing. Um, and then you make it spring and suddenly there's all these sort of boys, these long feathers. And you go, oh, where the hell did he come from? You know, but, um, uh, anyway, the, the, so we haven't done anything in reproduction. As for aging, we would love to do a long-term follow-up experiment. Starling for 20 years. So you have to give us a pretty big grant <laughs> to do it. People have tried to do it in zebra finch, and there they did seem to see something. So zebra finches are much less long lived, and so you can actually keep them long enough to really see significant amounts of mortality. And it, yes, in, in that case, it does indeed seem to be the case that aging is sped up. But interestingly, zebra finches don't get fatter under food insecurity. So there's a species difference. It's not all species that show this. There's now a number of studies from zebra finches and a number from starlings, not just by us, but by other people. And it does seem to be a reliable pattern that you can see something starlings. Now there could be something different about the ecology of zebra finches, but there you, but you do, yet, yet they don't put on weight, but presumably in the food insecurity, they, they still have to, they're still reallocating somehow. And there, so it's Pat Monaghan's group who did that. And I think they did see a, a mortality effect. In humans, there are some indication that uh, uh, people who are under food restriction uh, don't eat the same type of food, and not yes. only in terms of uh, calories, but in terms of, uh, of uh, glycemic index. And um, would it be possible in birds to have uh, two types of seed? You know, some that have a higher glycemic index than the yeah. others, and yeah. see if when there are food restriction, they tend to go to the yeah. Uh, higher glycemic uh, calories, uh, yeah. glycemic index. Yeah, it's a great question. We just haven't done it. We just we just haven't uh, ha haven't done it. And also, I mean, captive starlings have a pretty pretty strong hierarchy of food preferences. I mean, they're quite carnivorous birds. They're really they're, they strongly preferred food is insects, and then fruits, and then grains. Uh, they're not really seed eaters, they'll eat sort of soft grains. But, uh, so in, in, that's why you see them so much in proximity to humans. They can eat sort of processed grains and stuff like that, but they're not, they're not really seedy. They won't eat hard seeds particularly. So it's hard to envisage an experiment where they just wouldn't eat the insects first. I mean, that's, that, you know, that's, it's hard to kind of come up with what that would be. But no, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, Um, so in the west of Ireland, we say they, uh, like the thatching, we say these people are survivors from the famine and whatnot. So from your study, would you have confidence to say that these people survived because they were, because of the lack of food or because they were already predisposed to, their, <laughs> their metabolism was already not great. So they were bigger people, they survived the famine or... Is it a mix of both or? Well, uh, I, yeah, I wouldn't like to speculate, but um, first of all, the fact that fatter people survive famines better is actually really, really well documented. I mean, it really is true. You know, fat really is beneficial. Like you can, if famine strikes, the people who are fatter really do fare better. So it really does work. Right? Uh, so that, but when, you know, what you're talking about reminds me of the famous uh, thrifty genes hypothesis, which was a kind of hypothesis about the human susceptibility to adiposity because we've lived through so many periodic. There's been waves of selection for fatness or, or, or for the, um, the abilities at least to, to save energy. Now, I, I, Alex can say more about, yeah, okay, she's not, she's shaking her head. That's why I, I felt that that wasn't really a current yeah, idea, no more idea. And I, I, yeah, 
thrifty phenotype more. So, um, I, you know, I can't, I can't comment on that. What we're talking about here is really not genotypic differences, but pla you know, a pla a, a, an ability for plasticity, which you assume to be sort of present in all normally functioning uh, you know, individuals, as it were. They're bigger because they've less access to food, but we don't know if that's also because they probably come from a line of people. Yeah, that are... yeah. Well, which is which is which is the the joy of having an experimental model, right? Where you can. No, no, but we so all of these birds. Oh, some of these studies we get siblings actually, and we not not the long term one that I showed you, but the other ones. Well, the the, the SFS experience is the very same bird, right? In it's a within subjects design, but and then some of the others we either randomly assign or we actually get pairs of siblings and put them into the different treatments. So we're pretty sure it's, you know, this is not to do with long, you know, what lineage you come from. Okay, well, thank you very much.